Today, we are going to be talking about the ins and outs of spasticity, of muscle tightness, muscle cramping, muscle spasms, and I'm even going to show you specific stretches that you can do for the muscle groups that are most likely to get tight and spastic when you have multiple sclerosis. We're also going to get into the different types of stretching and stretches that are out there. So I'm excited to share these with you. So let's get started. Spasticity, tightness, and stretching for multiple sclerosis. The first thing I wanted to cover were a couple of different definitions because let's be honest, there's so many things that people mean when they say they have muscle tightness or some people will say I have muscle spasms or I have muscle cramping or I have spasticity. And so I thought it'd be really good to just explain what the basic differences are because it does make a difference. So a muscle spasm, is when a muscle involuntarily contracts and then relaxes. So this could be one spasm where it contracts and relaxes, or it could be a couple of different spasms where contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax, and it feels like that pulsing. Sometimes that pulse is very quick. Other times it's more prolonged and it lasts over a period of time, but it contracts. And then the key thing here, it relaxes, it goes away. Now, a muscle cramp, essentially, it's the same thing as a spasm, but the contraction lasts longer. And again, this is different for everyone, but for some people, the contraction might just be a couple of seconds or maybe even a couple of minutes, but it can be as intense as maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It's, it's more, uh, it's a longer hold, it's more prolonged. And then spasticity, is one of the characteristics of multiple sclerosis. It's one of the common symptoms. And there's actually many levels of spasticity, which we will get into in a second. So the main thing about spasticity is that the muscles stiffen or tighten and it prevents normal fluid movement. That is the main characteristic thing about spasticity is that it's not just a spasm, it's not just a cramp that, that hurts and is annoying, but it prevents mobility, it prevents movement, it can affect our movement, our walking, our speech, pretty much any motor action that we have. Addi additionally, this is caused by an imbalance of electrical signals from our brain and spinal cord. So muscle spasm and muscle cramping is caused from the muscle. The muscle is the issue, whereas spasticity is caused from our brain and spinal cord. It's that imbalance of electrical signals. So there's a different way to treat spasticity rather than just general muscle tightness. So this is what I wanted to show you. I, I wish that this font was a little bit darker, but I hope that you can still see pretty clearly what this is. So this is the modified Ashworth scale. And this is what a lot of doctors, especially physical therapists, will use to classify what level your spasticity is. And as you can see, it's rated zero, one, one plus, two, three, and four. So if you have zero, that is no increase in muscle tone, no tightness, no spasticity, nothing is going on, your muscles are acting as they should. Then a one, a grade one, means that you have slight increase in muscle tone and it's observed by a catch and release. So if you can see my arm right now, what that means is if, I'm, if my arm is straight and I'm trying to bend my arm, what that means is I'm trying to bend the arm and it catches, but then it releases. And I'm still able to move throughout the full range, but it might have that catch, like a tightness. Okay, and then it lets go. So that, that would be a grade one, a catch, but then it releases. And you can still move throughout the full range of motion. Now a one plus is where it starts to get a little bit trickier. So a one plus is a slight increase in muscle tone, meaning that there's that tightness in the muscle. It's manifested by a catch, and then there is still a release. However, there's actually a little bit of resistance. So whereas the grade one was catch, okay, and then it fully releases and I'm able to move with normal movement, a one plus, means, okay, I'm trying to bend my elbow and there's catch, and then I can still move throughout the full range, but there's resistance 
throughout that whole part. So it's a, it's harder to move through it, but it can move to that whole range. And then a two is the, kind of the same thing. You can move it, but there's resistance throughout most of the range of motion instead of the one plus where you can usually get at least halfway and that range of motion resistance is just the second half. A two means that most of that movement has resistance. A grade three is a considerable increase in muscle tone and passive movement is difficult, meaning I would be able to grab on and try to bend, but it's really hard. And you, I'd feel like you're resisting me. We likely can't go through full range. And I just feel like there's a lot of pressure and maybe we only get here. We can't even bend more than half the way. And then a grade four is rigidity. And rigidity is very severe. This means that there is nothing that literally the strongest person in the world could try to bend your elbow. And if your elbow is in a spastic extension, that strongest person in the world will not be able to bend your elbow. No amount of strength of external force can move a rigid muscle. So those are the four different types. Usually people range between the one and three categories. Um, zero again is obviously no spasticity and four is just that, that severe level of spasticity. Okay, all right, um, so there's a difference, as I mentioned earlier, for treatments of the tightness or cramping versus spasticity. So for tightness and cramping, spasms, for those type of muscular tightnesses, the, there's many things we can do. First is muscle stretching. The second is staying hydrated. That's a huge thing. One reason that muscles get tight and cramp and spasm is because we are dehydrated. And this is a very common issue with people who have multiple sclerosis and especially if they also have bladder or bowel issues, because even though it's still important to hydrate and drink water throughout the day, people believe that it will also make them urinate more often and it has that lack of control feeling with if you have urinary incontinence or urgency or frequency so it's very common to be dehydrated and that can lead to muscle tightness muscle cramping exercising and moving regularly can help reduce muscle tension and tightness and tone Improving your nutrition. Nutrition is a big one that a lot of people forget about, but making sure you're getting enough magnesium, enough protein, there's a bunch of other things nutrition-wise that help with muscle tension and tone and cramping. And then muscle relaxers, and there's so many different types of this. It could be medicinal, but it also could be more um, supplements and holistic. So you can get these all from the store, capsaicin, arnica, Icy Hot, Tiger Bomb. And one cool thing about muscle relaxers is that something different works for everyone. So if you've tried Icy Hot before and didn't know to dif notice a difference, you might notice an improvement with Tiger Bomb or with capsaicin or um, some of the other options. So you can talk to your doctor first, but I would encourage you to try one option whether it's the improved nutrition, a muscle relaxer, exercising regularly, try one option for at least two weeks before you make any judgment calls on if it's helping or not. And then if it doesn't, switch it up and try something new. And then a treatment for spasticity is a bunch of different options, luckily. So physical therapy as well as occupational therapy. Physical therapy is going to focus on passive stretching as well as active stretching. I'll get into that in, on the next slide. And occupational therapy will more likely be focusing on splints and casting to help prevent further spasticity and keep the flexibility that you do have. Additionally, medications such as baclofen, tizanidine, diazepam, those are all really common medications. Talk to your neurologist about which one might be best for you, especially if you are taking other medications. You want to make sure that there's no negative reactions. 
Another option for medications, and I have it under that section, is the botulinum toxin, which is Botox injections. So this is an option where they can actually inject Botox into a specific muscle group. So if your hamstrings are tight, then they can put Botox in your hamstrings, or if it's your quads or your ankle dorsiflexors, they can put it in a very specific area. Now, if, the, if none of these things that we've reviewed help, that's usually when they go to a more serious option such as surgery. So there's a few different options. You'll see the first one is the intrathecal baclofen pump. So this is when it, they use baclofen. So earlier we had mentioned that it was a medication, but this is when there's an actual pump that they put inside of your abdomen and they can monitor exactly how much baclofen is released throughout your body. So that's one option. A rhizotomy is actually a surgical procedure where they cut away a part of the spinal nerve. And in some cases, that's been shown to help reduce spasticity. And then the last one is a tenotomy, which is when they release the tendon. Because some, sometimes when there's spasticity, the tendon gets so short that you can't move. The tendon physically will not lengthen. So they release, they make a little snip in the tendon and it can release that tension. I'm just going to check to see if we have any questions yet. Uh, Michael says, when I stand up, my whole body tightens up for a few seconds and releases before I can move. Yes, that's the spasticity. Um, in short doses or temporary spasticity is very common when changing positions. Okay, that was all for now. Okay, so moving on, types of stretching. So, and actually before, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. So I wanna just touch on something. Okay, so one thing that I wanna touch on is that there, I, we're about to go into different stretches for spasticity and the different types of stretches because there's lots of different mechanism and strategies that we can use. But I also wanna point out that for some people, spasticity is actually very useful. For some people who have a lot of muscle weakness, your body actually utilizes your spasticity to help you stay upright and to help you balance and, and to stand. Whereas if you lose that spasticity, if you were to try baclofen or get, get a, um, muscle relaxer or, or medication or anything, if you lose that spasticity, your body has to rely on the strength that you have. So if you don't have enough strength, that could prevent you from staying up in a standing position or walking. And one example I wanna share with you, I had a patient one time who I was treating in the clinic in person. And one thing that she wanted to work on was her muscle tightness. And there's a little bit of spasticity, probably a grade one, I, I wouldn't even say a one plus, but there was some tightness there. So all we did was some stretching and a little bit of massage and she left feeling a lot better, much looser. And then I saw her maybe two or three days after just because she had another session scheduled. So she came back in and she said to me, she was like, whoa, I felt fine when I left the clinic, but we cannot do that again. My leg felt so unstable. And for her, it was her hamstring. So it was right behind the knee that we were working on that tendon that was really tight. So she came back and she was like, we can't do that again. I felt very unbalanced. She didn't luckily have any falls or anything, but what that told me was that her body was using that tightness to help her stay upright and to help her stay balanced. So I just wanna share that anytime you utilize any of these strategies, whether it's a stretch or whether it's a massage or a medication, go slowly and analyze how your body feels from using that technique or that strategy or medication, because there's not really a good way to know how your body's going to react when your muscles are looser until you actually get them to be a little bit looser. So just err on the side of safety. And if you're using one of these strategies, just make sure you're, you make sure you're being safe that you're not going to fall over or that you're still able to stand up straight. So I just wanted to share that. 
Um, Melissa asks, does a TENS machine help at all? Yeah, a TENS machine, I'm going to say yes and no. It's different for every person. A TENS machine is usually meant to help with pain or more of a sensation rather than actual muscle tightness. However, I have seen it help with muscle tightness in some people. So, so you could give it a go. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, percent. Okay, so back to the different types of stretching. And one thing that's not on here is massage. There are different massage techniques that someone else can do for you to reduce the tightness. But I, today I wanted to review the types of stretching because that's something that you can do at home right now if you wanted to. So the first type is active. Active stretching means that you are stretching on your own. And there's lots of different types of active stretching. What we're going to be doing tonight is active stretching because we are doing it to ourselves. Passive stretching is assisted. So passive stretching is when you might be laying on a, a plinth in a PT clinic and the PT is stretching you. Or maybe you're laying at home and a significant other or sibling or uh, caretaker is stretching you. So it's someone else who is assisting the stretch for you and you are just relaxed. You're not doing anything. Now, it's important to do a little bit of both. It's not that active is better than passive or passive is better than active. They're just different types of stretching. I know some people who only do active and I, when I say they only do active, it's they only do active stretching on their own and maybe stretching through yoga or Pilates and they actually end up with low back pain or tightness in their hamstrings because they're only doing active versus also doing a little bit of passive and also doing specific muscle group training. So it's important to get a little bit of both. Next is static. So static means longer hold time. So static is usually described as you're holding for at least 20 seconds I usually tell people 30 seconds because as humans, we have a tendency to count too fast. But if you have if you have a timer in front of you, 20 seconds is what research shows is effective. And to do it two to four times each side. So if you're stretching your hamstrings statically, you would do a static stretch on your left side, hold for 30, 20 to 30 seconds, and then take a break. And then you can maybe switch to the other side for 20 to 30 seconds and take a break. That's one time each side. So you'd go back to the left side. You'd do two to four times each side. Dynamic stretching is shorter holds, but more repetitions. So dynamic is when you'd go to stretch your hamstring, but you only hold it for maybe two to three seconds and then release. And then stretch it again for two to three seconds and then release. And you would do that for about 20 to 30 repetitions. So it's not as long of a hold, but it's a lot of short holds. And do, please do not confuse that with bouncing. It's not the same as stretch release, stretch release, stretch release. And so you look like you're doing this bouncing movement. It's a stretch and hold, release, hold, release. Bouncing or ballistic stretching is never a good thing to do. Um, lastly, PNF stretching. So this is something that it's a little bit difficult to explain via a webinar, um, but PNF stretching is essentially it's proprioceptive, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And so there's different ways that you can stretch and it's basically moving an arm or a leg at an angle or a diagonal and it sometimes involves resistance. So you'd be pushing against me and then release, then push against me and release. So there's a little bit of push and pull movement. So we just went over a lot of different types of stretches. So what do I do? It's the biggest question that I get asked, rightfully so. So I'm just gonna share with you what research shows. Number one, they say that dynamic stretches can be more effective if done before you exercise because your muscles aren't warmed up yet. So the idea is since your muscles aren't warm, if you stretch for two to three seconds, then release and then do that 20 to 30 times on both sides, you're stretching while also warming your muscles up. 
And then on the contrary, after you exercise to do static stretching. So your muscles are already warm. They're, they're loose because you were just exercising. You're just trying to cool yourself down and get that stretch out. So you would hold for the 20 to 30 second time frame, two to four times each side after you exercise. Now, what I wanna share here is try both. And whether you're exercising or not, try to stretch a muscle dynamically. And then the next day, try to stretch that same muscle statically. Statically? I don't know if that's a word. In a static way. And, and see, analyze. Did one feel better than the other? There is no one way. Every person's body is different. I might feel so much looser and better after dynamic stretching, but you might feel like your walking is so much better because your muscles are looser after static stretching. There's no right or wrong. So I would urge you to try both on different days. If you do both in the same day, you won't know which one it was that you felt better with and see if one feels better. If it does, stick with that one more often than not. If one does not feel better, then you can do either one. There's again, there's no right or wrong. So just pick whichever one you want to do that day. Um, additionally, the next tab here says do a mix. If one doesn't necessarily feel better for you, maybe on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you do dynamic. And on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're doing static. It's up to you how you want to mix it up. But also, in terms of the passive and active, which remember that's when either someone is stretching you or you are doing the stretches on your own, do a mix, mix it up. You never wanna do only one type of stretching. Similar to how you'd never wanna do only one exercise routine. It's good to switch things up. And lastly, I just wanted to share that yoga is active because you're either standing or sitting or laying down. And it's a lot of work, trust me. I've been doing more yoga lately and it is hard and it requires a lot of strength and doing the stretches in those positions because no one's helping you is active. And the reason I wanna share that is because some people will share with me, I'll ask them, are you doing stretches for your spasticity or for your tight muscles? And they'll say, oh yeah, I do a lot of yoga. Well, yoga to me does not mean stretching. You, you do stretches in yoga, you do active stretches, but your body might need more passive stretching. So if you're doing yoga, and I love yoga, I'm not saying yoga is bad, it's just, it's only one type of stretching. So if you're doing yoga, but you still have tightness or spasticity, or it doesn't help release your tension as much, consider passive or consider a different type of active stretching. So I wanted to share with you what type of muscles tend to become spastic specifically in multiple sclerosis. And there's a lot, but these are the most common ones. So these are the ones that we're going to do demonstrate stretches with for tonight. So the first upper traps, and to be honest, these are tight muscles in everyone. MS especially, but even people who don't have MS. This is where we keep a lot of our tension, stress, anytime we feel anxiety, depression, overwhelmed, we tend to hike our shoulders up even just an inch. So slight that you might not even notice that, that your shoulders are higher up towards your ears. But when you do, when you do that slight increase, these muscles are working nonstop. So one fun, I don't know if I use the word fun, but one challenge I did for myself one time, it was in the winter time. And I remember I told myself, I'm going to try to remember as often as I can throughout the day to tell myself to relax my shoulders. And almost every time that I thought to myself to relax my shoulders, I didn't feel like I was actually holding them up. I just said it to myself. So I'd say, relax your shoulders. And almost always they would drop at least a little bit which tells me that throughout the day, I was bringing my shoulders up without even realizing it, therefore causing tension here. The reason I'm spending so much time talking about this is because tension here can cause tension in the rest of your body. It can cause headaches. It can have, it's such a central location that it can have a lot of negative responses throughout the rest of our body. The next is hip flexors, or sorry, skipped one, elbow flexors. So our elbows, 
come in like this because a lot of us sit throughout the day with our arms at our sides versus extended. So elbow flexors can become spastic. Hip flexors where your, um, your I'll demonstrate when we do the exercise, but your hips are uh, hinged forward a little bit. Knee flexors as well as ankle plantar flexors. So what we're gonna do is practice for those specific body parts and I'm going to share with you the importance of why why they are a little bit more flexible. In my opinion, there's many ways that we can release muscle tension. So stretching is one, massage is another, and then more of a rolling movement, whether that's foam rolling or actually, hold on a second. Oh, I happen to have this, it was on my ground, uh, like a, a muscle roller uh, that you can roll on your body. So there's a few different ways that you can release tension, but stretching is different from massage, which is another type. Would Tai Chi also be considered active? Yes, good question. Linda, does massage help spasticity? Okay, yeah, so a good amount of questions on massage. Yes, massage can help spasticity. Keep in mind, there are so many different types of massage out there. So you can go to your PT for a massage. You can do a personal massage. If your bicep is spastic, meaning you're in elbow flexion, you can try to massage on your own some of your muscles. If you go to a masseuse or a massage therapist, keep in mind there's so many different types of massage. Go light. You don't want to just go right in and heavily go light and then see how it felt. If it felt okay, next time you can go a little bit heavier then a little bit heavier the next time, but start light and easy. But yes, massage can help reduce spasticity as well. Good questions. Okay, so I want to demonstrate some of these stretches for you guys. Sorry, see, fuzzy that landed on my eye. Got it. Uh, and then we'll go through more questions. So. Um, I'm first going to show you the upper body ones. So the first one was the upper traps. And this one's really important because this is the one where we tend to hold a lot of tension. So I'm going to scoot back. Okay, and you can do these with me right now if you prefer. Because we're limited on time, I'm only gonna show you one time on each side. So, I also don't know if I'm your image to you or not right now, but this is the left side of my body. So when I say I'm going to the left, that's over here. Doesn't matter if you go with me or alternating, because we're gonna do both sides anyways. So for upper traps, there's the best one that I like is sitting out tall and just let your, your head and neck fall towards one side. You are not, and I cannot stress this enough, you are not, actively trying to pull your head down as far as you can go. It doesn't matter how far your head comes down. If you feel these muscles tight and squeezing and tension there, your head is doing too much work. It should just feel like it's dead weight over to the side and you'll feel the stretch right up top here. And keep in mind for any stretch, you're gonna feel it wherever you're tightest. There are lots of neck muscles. If your upper traps or upper trapezius isn't the tightest one, that e then even though I'm saying you'll feel it here, you might feel it here. Or maybe slightly back, the levator scapula, that's another tight one. Okay, then we'll slowly come up. And then same thing over here. And again, if you're doing that, I, I prefer to do neck stretches in a static way. So just the more of the prolonged hold because I, I have a tendency to get dizzy. So, Doing this statically is what we're doing now. We're just holding for about 20 seconds or so, and then we'll release and do the other side, whereas dynamic would be a hold, one, two, three, come back up to release it, then back down, hold, one, two, three, and up. So for me, this is too much head movement. I would get a little bit dizzy with that, so I just do static for my neck. The next one was the elbow flexors. So this is because a lot of us were sitting like this throughout the day. And while they're not bent all the way, they're still bent. They're not out straight. I know you can't see all of my arms. Um, but we sit like this a lot throughout the day. Or we're texting on our phones or we're typing on the computer. Our arms, our elbows are in flexion. So one of my favorite stretches, there's several different ways to do this, but you put your arm out, palm down, 
grab on you'll see i'm on my whole hand like not my palm but like my the balls of my fingers the knuckles down to the end i'm not pulling just my fingertips but i'm pulling here and then bring it down a little bit and then i like to put it down on my lap or on the chair so you can put it down here if you want so you're just getting that nice stretch and you'll feel it here and depending on how tight you are, again, if your forearms are tighter than your bicep, you'll feel it down here. If your biceps are tighter because they're bending your elbows, then you'll feel the stretch up here. Again, there's no right or wrong. The goal is just stretching out the muscles. So this is the stretch. And then of course, you would do it on both sides. You can reach forward, pull it down. You can hold it here. You can put it on your lap or you can put it on the chair. And you're sitting up tall. If I show you from the side, you'll see my posture. I'm up tall. Also, you'll see my wrist is not touching the chair. I don't have much wrist mobility, but that's okay. I'm still feeling the stretch right in here. So that's one of my favorite ones for the bicep, for people who have flexed elbows. And also just throughout the day, dropping your arms down fully extended, just for a minute or so. Just let them let them hang so that you're getting that stretch and just to show you dynamically so again i just demonstrated static where you would hold this for about 20 seconds if you were to do this in a dynamic way it would look more like this so hold one two three then release the stretch this for me releases the stretch because i'm bending it then hold one two three release one two three release and I'm, I would do about 20 to 30 of these so I do more repetitions but shorter holds the next one is for the hip flexors and I'm gonna use my non-wheeled chair for this one so if you're in a wheeled chair please do not use that pardon me as I just move around a little bit so for this one I the, the hip flexors are these muscles right here in the groin. The reason this is such an important one is because A, we sit a lot throughout the day. I don't know about you, but most of us sit a lot throughout the day. And when we're sitting, our hips are flexed. So our hip flexors are shortened. Anytime we're sitting, they're shortened. And if, they, if we stand up, now the hip flexors are extended. If I show you from the side, you'll see they're extended. But if our hip flexors are too tight, that's when it will shift us forward. So if you're someone who walks like this, you know, your back is flat, but you're just hinged forward, it's likely because your hip flexors are tight. So they are pulling you forward. If you can stretch these, you'll be more upright, up straight. So there's lots of different ways to stretch the hip flexors. And my favorite way is actually utilizing my bed or the couch but I, I couldn't bring you into my bedroom or a couch tonight. So I'm gonna show you a seated option where you just swivel. If you have arm rest, this won't work, but you swivel, hold on. You don't wanna feel like you're gonna fall off of the chair. Hold on to the back and the front and you let your front leg drop. Once you're here, that might be enough of a stretch for you. You might feel a good stretch right here in hip flexors. If you don't, you can try to shimmy that back leg to get a little bit straighter, or you can tuck your pelvis under and you'll feel more of this stretch there. So to hold this for a static way, you just hold for 20 to 30 seconds. For a dynamic stretch, you would hold, 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 and relax. For me, when I relax this leg and it comes forward, I don't feel the stretch as much. So I stretch one, two, three, relax. One, two, three, relax. So it's not much movement, but if, if you're doing this with me, you'll feel there's a difference between the stretch and no stretch. And then of course you would just do the same thing on the other side. This one can be a tricky position to get into, which is why I like the option on the bed or the couch, but for our purposes tonight, it's a good option. Relax, straighten. And you, again, you're feeling right in the front of the hip flexors. Relax. So that's that one. The knee flexors, so these are the ones behind our knee. So our hamstrings are responsible for bending our knee. 
Now, if the hamstrings are too tight, that can prevent us from straightening our knee. And if we can't straighten our knee, that means that you might be walking. I don't know if you can see my legs with the colors in this room, but you might walk with your knees slightly bent. I'm exaggerating, but we need that knee extension, which requires strength of the quads and flexibility of the hamstring. So my favorite stretch for the hamstring, you're sitting up tall, one leg comes forward. I'm just gonna move this down slightly. Okay. So sitting up tall, one leg comes forward. Doesn't matter what the foot does. It doesn't need to be up like this or down. Doesn't really matter. Sit up tall and then hinge forward. And everyone is different. That your back needs to stay flat. For some people, you might be up here and you should be feeling the stretch in the back of your thigh. And you might feel it just from sitting up tall. And that's great. If you don't feel it, then you can hinge slightly further forward or slightly further. Or everyone's going to be a little bit different. And I want to point out, you're not putting your hands on your knee. It's on your lower thigh. Static stretch would just be holding for 20 to 30 seconds, two to three, two to four times each side. Dynamic would be one, two, three, release. One, two, three, release. And you do that 20 to 30 times. And then of course, as always, we repeat on the other side. The last stretch that I wanted to share with you um, was the ankle plantar flexors. And one that I didn't put it was also dorsiflexors. So when, when you have foot drop, which is another very common symptom in multiple sclerosis, usually the cause is either one or two things. One, weakness of the muscles on the front of our shin, the tibialis anterior, and or tightness in the calf muscle, so tightness on the back of our lower leg. So we want to work on strengthening, but we also want to work on stretching the calf muscles and the ankle. So in order to stretch the calf, you could use a, a dog leash, a yoga strap, a bathrobe belt, a regular belt, or even, I've been using this lately because I just keep it right on the back of my chair, even the strap from a bag, whatever you have around, and you put it under the balls of your feet and you use it to help pull your legs up. And again, your posture is up tall and you're pulling your, sorry, not your legs up, you're pulling your toes up towards you and your knee is straight. If your knee is slightly bent, you're likely not gonna feel the stretch as much. So this would be stretching the calf and then just demonstrating quickly on the other side so you can see. So I'm pulling with my arms. And I'm sitting up tall. My calf muscles are pretty tight. I don't feel like I can lean further forward. If you have flex more flexible calf muscles than me, then I'm going to lighten up my hands just so I can demonstrate. Then you might be able to lean further and pull. And then the other ankle direction is just keeping your ankles down. So I'll show you this at first. Keeping it down as your leg is extended can, can stretch the ankle dorsiflexors right in here. So that's another option too. So lots of different positions and lots of different stretches. Keep in mind too, if you couldn't do any of these, this was just one option for all those muscle groups. There are so many options. There are always ways that you can modify these stretches to fit your body. So don't feel discouraged if any of these you felt like you couldn't do or you couldn't feel the stretch. There's always ways to modify them. So that's all I've got for you guys tonight. I will go over a few questions to see uh, if I can help clarify anything. So let's get started on that. Um, okay, Amy says, I use a tennis ball in a sock to massage so I don't bruise myself. Yes, actually, Amy, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I will pull up. We had a question earlier. Um, it's a little bit long, but I'm going to try to make it shorter. So I got an email today uh, from someone who was asking about what to do for her upper thigh. So basically, she was describing how she never remembers hurting it, but it feels like it's bruised. There's not actually a bruise, there's no discoloration, but it feels like a bruise. She calls it her hot spot. Um, she's been icing it off and on 
Um, can you see what else she says? Hotspot. Uh, she's had areas like this on her legs before, but um, it comes and goes. Sometimes it itches like crazy. So the reason I wanted to call out this question is because uh, it, this, something like this can be very common for people with MS. And it's hard to say if that is just a sensory issue, which we have a separate video on sensation. So I'll refer you to that for the full lowdown. But it's hard to say if it's just a sensory issue where your brain, for whatever reason, is getting a message that this spot on your thigh is in fight or flight mode and it's sending these sensations to it, or if it's actually a spasticity or a tight muscle issue. The best thing that I can suggest is try some of the sensory strategies, see if that helps or not. And then you could try some of these strategies that we're talking about tonight and see if that helps. You know, in just from earlier, movement, just general movement, walking around if possible, standing up and sitting down, using those muscles can sometimes help those spots go away. If not, some stretches. If not, massage. If not, rolling it out or trigger point release. So there's lots of different things to try. But again, don't try too many things at once because if something helps, you won't know what it is. And then if it comes back, you won't know which thing to do. So I wanted to answer that question. Um, but putting a tennis ball in a sock, as Amy suggested, is a good way to massage uh, without losing yourself. Linda says, I have pain sometimes when walking in my right groin. So will stretching hip flexor help? So if the pain is caused from tightness or a little bit of spasticity in the hip flexor, then yes, stretching will help. But if it's because your hip flexors are weak, and the more you walk, the more you're asking them to work, but they're tired or they they just don't have that strength, then strengthening for endurance of the hip flexors is what will help. And it could be a mix of both. Deborah says for dynamic is the rest part the same time as the stretch part. Oh, I see. So stretch for three seconds, relax for three seconds. Um, if you want it to be, not necessarily. I honestly don't usually count the off time or the rest time. I usually, let's see, one, two, three, then come out of it and then go back in. So I personally only am resting or in the off phase for maybe one or two seconds. It doesn't need to be symmetrical. Good question though. Uh, stretch hip flexor cramps and hamstring. That was from Kanita. Rita, what are your thoughts about massage guns? I actually got a massage gun recently. Uh, those things are intense. Let me tell you that. They look intense, but I just started using one. Not, not that I started using, I just tried it out. Massage guns, I think, are good for some people. I know it's such a wishy-washy, wishy-wash, wish, I'm forgetting the phrase, wishy-wash, me. Anyways. It's not a good answer because it's different for every person, but some theraguns are usually very intense. So sometimes when you do something that's too intense and maybe it's even just massaging with your own hand. So maybe I want to massage my bicep right here and I'm just doing this type of massage. Even if using my thumb is too intense, you could get even more spastic or even more tight or if it's stretching and you stretch too far and you go into a really, really deep stretch, your body's not used to that. So your body might say, whoa, what is this? And it, it's fight or flight mode and it, it's nervous, it's gonna tighten back up. So you never wanna do anything that's too, too drastic or too, too intense. So keeping that in mind, it's something you could try, see how it goes, start very light and then work your way from there based on how that went. Denise, how long do you hold the ankle stretches for? My ankle feels frozen. So it's up to you if you're trying static, it's always about 20 to 30 seconds for two to four times each side or the dynamic, which is two to three seconds and then rest and then back to two to three seconds. And another thing too, research is indicating now that for people who have spasticity, more prolonged stretching is most beneficial. So static stretching, but instead of just only 20 to 30 seconds, maybe holding it for a minute 
or three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes. This is best when passive. So the stretches that we just did, remember were active because we were the ones doing it. So if you have someone stretching you or they can put you in a position and then um, maybe put props or something to keep your legs or your arms, whatever it is you're stretching in that position, try holding the stretch for several minutes that that's the newest thing in research that people are or that that research has proven is pro, more prolonged holds can be beneficial for spasticity so meaning many minutes at a time karen get botox in my calves for foot drop so if i stretch like so if i stretch like crazy do you think it can get better with strengthening also it's hard to say. It's so individualized. Sometimes people need Botox and stretching and strengthening. Sometimes it's just if you have the right stretches, your brain, because remember, spasticity is a brain thing, not necessarily a muscle thing. So usually it's a little bit of both. In, the, in my personal experience, when I'm treating people who have muscle tightness and spasticity, Oops, sorry for the shake. It's usually a combination of spasticity, which is the brain issue, the neural impulse issue, and muscle tightness or muscle cramps, muscle tone. So the stretches that we're talking about help with more of the muscle tone. Whereas if the issue is coming from the brain, that's where more of the medication is gonna be helpful. So it's hard to say it's something that you could absolutely talk to your neurologist about potentially maybe uh your botox maybe you're still taking it but you're able to take less because the stretching is helping to reduce the tone part and therefore you are feeling a little bit better so you might not need as much botox so it can be a little bit of both but definitely definitely it's something you want to talk to a doctor about tammy what kind of stretching if the bottom of your foot feels tight one of my favorite stretches for the bottom of your foot is grabbing your foot and pulling your toes backwards like to pulling your toes towards you that can stretch the bottom of your foot or rolling the bottom of your foot with a tennis ball or an iced a frozen water bottle that can really help holly can i stretch my ankle while lying down yes absolutely so that's what i mentioned earlier all these stretches today i did in a seated position only because i'm seated while i'm presenting this to you but you can do them lying down, you can do them laying on your side, you can do them in your bed, on a couch, lots of different positions. Wishy-washy. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. I don't know why, uh, why I couldn't think of washy. Uh, Karen, other good stretch lying down for hip flexor, is it keeping one foot on the floor and the other on the bed? Yes, so there's a couple of different um, positions that you can do it in, but one option is yes, one foot stays on the bed and then one foot extends to the floor. And it depends on the height of the surface that you're using. So if you're on, was it a bed or a couch that you said? Oh, lying down, you didn't say. So if, you, if the surface you're on is too high, where your, your foot that's on the ground doesn't actually touch the ground, you can use a strap like we used for the ankle dorsiflexor and plantar flexor stretches and pull your leg back. Or if your foot does touch the ground, you can just inch it back a little bit further. So there's a couple of different strategies, but yes. Rod, I was, I, was, I was just started with the legs and I could feel a cramp in my calf. It released as soon as relaxed it. Yep. So try, try to always go lighter than you think you need to with these stretches. Some of the stretches might even feel really light, but you get that your body and brain get that sensation of, whoa, what's happening? And it tightens up, especially if you're not used to doing some of these stretches. So I can't emphasize how important it is. Start lightly. Don't feel like, oh, I think I'm flexible with this one. Let me do a heavy stretch. No, no, no. Light stretches. And if it ever is painful, that's not good. It, none of these should be painful. If it ever does start to cramp or tighten, just slowly back off. Kanita, if I hang from bar overhead by my arm, even with feet on the ground, I cramp and collapse when I let go. How can I work up to this? So that actually sounds like more of a, a strengthening and endurance issue. So practicing 
even with feet on the ground, I cramp and collapse when I let, so when you let go, it sounds like it's when the cramping and collapsing sets in. So don't let go fully. If you're normally holding on 100%, try to only hold on 90% or 95%, then 90, then 85, then 80, and slowly work on letting the grip and the strength that you're holding with your arms lessen. Rod, how should it work that cramp how should maybe how should I work that cramp feeling out? Um, it's different for everyone. For some people, cramping, you can grab your hands and, and um, massage the muscle lightly. For other people, standing up and putting weight through your body can help release a cramp. So it's more trial and error. Then once you find something that works for you, you can go to it every time. Wendy, how would you do the hip stretch while in bed? Yeah, so that's the one. I don't have an option here. You're laying on your back. Both both legs are on the bed, but you're close to the edge, and you let one leg hang off of the bed. And you, there there's specifics with that. I don't know that I want you trying it based on what I'm saying because it can cause a little bit of low back discomfort. So then you'd bring one leg towards you. There's specifics about it that if you, if you are seeing a physiotherapist or physical therapist, um, or if someone does come in to help you with exercises, it's something that you can ask them about because I wouldn't want you to try any of these and then get low back pain or tweak anything, but that's how you would do the one on the bed. Um, Wendy, it's Wendy from Chilliwack. Did I say that right? British Columbia, Canada. Welcome, Wendy. Bruce, how to stretch for MS hug. So MS hug is a tricky one. And we talked about this during the general symptom management session. So I'd refer you back to that one. But in general, some people feel better. Their MS hug will feel better from stretching and others it doesn't. If it does, it can be stretching like this where you're turning to one side and then turning the other. You can reach overhead with, with one or both arms. Um, it can be going down like this, and then really extending, trying to opening up your chest. So there's a couple of different options. Um, for some people, stretching helps. For other people, movement helps. For some people, none of that helps, and they have to get a steroid or something from their doctor to help release it. Um, Kanita, hip flexor is what is cramping. Yes, yeah, so hip flexor, we, I demonstrated that one there. And then Amy, I do that stretch on the bed and my husband stands beside the bed by my torso. Yeah, so if you are doing the one on the bed, it is helpful if you can have someone nearby, purely just for safety so you don't roll off the bed because you do have to be on the edge so that one leg falls off. I hope you found this helpful and I hope you feel like you have a lot of different strategies and stretches and tools that you can start to implement on your own to hopefully help with your spasticity and muscle tightness. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to email me at Gretchen at drgretchenholly.com. And if you're looking for even more information and more MS specific exercises, feel free to look into my online MS wellness program, The Missing Link. There's a bunch of exercises in there specifically for MS, for strengthening, stretching, balance, and walking. But I have an entire video that you can watch that explains and shows you a behind the scenes look in to the program. If you're interested, you can go to my website, missinglink.com, spelled M-S-I-N-G link.com, or just reach out to me on social media or my email, and I can get you the information you need to learn more about it. Thanks for tuning in.